Hey friends, this is a flyby of Revelation 2 on Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and this is Sunday Postscript. Uh, it, we're back after a couple of weeks of guest speakers and different things happening in Emmanuel. We resumed today our study of Revelation verse by verse, section by section, chapter by chapter. Today we pressed all the way through the end of Revelation 2. And as always, I was compressed for time and I uh, I didn't get to say everything I, I hope to say, but there's far too much that could be said. Um. But it, it, was a, it was a really wonderful day in church. I just got back from a lunch that we hosted with the newcomers to Emmanuel. And it's been so uh, such a joy to meet uh, so many different people that are new to Emmanuel and to hear the stories of how God is, is working in their life. It is remarkable. Uh, the gospel is powerful. I met a couple just a few moments ago on the parking lot. We were talking as they were leaving and I was leaving. And they said that, you know, they just began to seek the Lord, read the Bible, and ended up coming to Christ, and then began to seek a church that teaches the Bible. And uh, through some friends, uh, they found Emmanuel, and my heart just rejoices in those kinds of stories. So today, we really began to survey uh, the two churches we've already covered in Revelation 2, but uh, from a high end or a high view as I've been just marinating in this chapter, chapter two and, and chapter three, in this part of Revelation, this is kind of the second part. Chapter one, sort of an introduction, the revelation of Jesus, Jesus appearing to John in a vision. Chapters two and three are Jesus dictating letters to the area churches through John. John is transcribing. And the more I think about it, the more marvelous, the more remarkable and wonderful it is. And so I want to talk uh, high end for just a few moments. First of all, Jesus has described the churches as candlesticks and that he's in the midst of the candlesticks and he's walking among the candlesticks. And this is so encouraging to me. We are not at this alone. Jesus' priority right now in time and history is his church and he is holding uh, the leaders of those churches and he is and he is walking amongst the midst of those churches. What that means to me is he is present, he is active, he is at work, he is transforming and working and growing his kingdom and sanctifying and growing individual believers. What it tells me is that he values the church. The church is not optional. The church is not uh, archaic or out of date or out of touch. The idea of church is not has not gone out of vogue, okay? No, this is still Jesus' plan A for the redemptive church age and the redemption of the world and the communication of the gospel of grace. And what I love about this is that he is talking to churches that he's going to rebuke and correct, and he's going to explain the issues that he has with them. But before he gets to any of that, just the idea that he loves his churches. He could be much harder than he is. He could be much more judgmental. He could bring really down a hard and heavy hammer, but he relates to his churches on the basis of love and grace as well as truth. He is being honest with them, but he's also being positive, and he's essentially calling the churches, those that he corrects, five of the seven, he's calling them to something called repentance. And repentance as believers is a precious thing. It, it's not penance. It's not hard work. It's not you making up for your wrongs. No, repentance is simply you realizing you're thinking, you're believing, you're doing the wrong thing, and then you turn and go the other direction. Jesus on the cross paid the price. So repentance is not trying to pay a price. It is simply understanding I'm facing and aiming and going the wrong direction, and I'm going to turn around and make a different decision, and I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to begin believing the right thing and doing the right thing as a result. And what I love about these two chapters is that Jesus is so, so gracious, even in his correction and in his rebuke. He does give some strong warnings. He does say to one particular woman and the people connected to her, um, you're all going to die unless you repent because he won't let them destroy his church. And that's where really what was at threat in this particular church. But um, at the end of every letter to each church, he 
promises something better than what he's requiring of them. So he is he is saying, let me rescue you from this and bring you into this. Let me rescue you from your sin, your self-destruction, or even your persecution, and I'm going to bring you in to something better. Every single situation, what Jesus promises at the end is better than what they were doing or what they had been distracted by. And that is profound to me, that he's always someone I run to. Repentance is a gift of grace and mercy, an expression of love. His, it's his heart open and his arms open so that I can run back to him and into his grace. I think it's interesting to note that the letter, the letter, it's one letter, but it's addressing seven churches and every church got the the good and the bad news of every other church. Every church gets to read everybody else's mail. So every church understood how he was handling each church. There's a specific accounting, there's a corporate body accounting, but then there's a very specific. These letters were not just to churches, not just to the region, but they were letter it was a letter to individuals because every letter ends with he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Basically, every individual has to reckon with uh, what they will do with the admonitions of Jesus. So the first church in Revelation 2 is the church of Ephesus, and it's the church that loves less. Now, we spent some time talking about this a couple weeks ago, so I won't belabor it. Jesus praises the church for unfainting service, endurance, and faithfulness to the truth. He then rebukes them that they left their first love. He calls them back to remember, to repent, to return and do the first works. What does that mean? Remember when you first met Christ, how you loved him, how you felt about him, and don't ever get very far from that. I told our church this morning, I say it often, the Christian life is an I love you too life. It's a responsive love. We don't do anything out of obligation or merely duty. We don't do anything because we have to or ought to. We do everything we do. It should all be driven by we love him because he first loved us. And the love of Christ constrains us. When your heart truly comes into contact with the magnificent, lavish love of Jesus, your natural response, spiritually, I I should say, is that your instinctive response is to love him back. And you just ask, how do I love him back? And then all of his dues in Scripture, all of his instructions in Scripture are simply expressions of how to love him in response to his love. So I, I think my challenge to you, my friend, is don't ever let your heart get too far from just loving Jesus. He loves you. His love is marvelous. When you understand and marinate your heart and mind in that love, you will naturally want to love him back. We then studied the, the suffering church, and I did not post a, uh, a postscript uh, two weeks ago when we talked about the suffering church, but this is the church of Smyrna, and they were poor, materially speaking, but rich, spiritually speaking, and they were suffering, and Jesus challenged them. He commanded them to fear not. He commanded them to endure the persecution. He told them it would only uh, last for a short time. He used the phrase 10 days. It will, it will be for a time. He challenges them to be faithful even unto death. Some of them would be called to die for their faith. And one was Polycarp, and we talked about him uh, a couple of weeks ago as well. I shared the story of his death. So the suffering church, the church that loves less, the church that suffers well. Today we unpack two churches, and I call them the churches that compromise. The churches that compromise are the church at Pergamos and the church at Thyatira. Now, The important thing to set up contextually is that these were cities of Asia Minor, cities of Western Turkey, modern-day Turkey. These were Roman cities that had Greek history and then Roman Empire ruling them. And Rome came in and elevated all the culture and infiltrated the culture with its Roman culture as well. So you've got this layered Greek-Roman culture. And it is first and foremost uh, polytheistic or Uh, pantheistic in terms of many gods, pantheon of Roman gods, Greek gods that were uh, co-opted into the Roman uh, paganism and the plurality of gods, fake gods, artificial gods, man-made gods. And the worship of these gods was required in Roman culture, especially the worship of Caesar as God. 
And so in these cities, there were many temples. I'm thinking particularly of Pergamos. There was a temple to Zeus. So if you really wanted big intervention in your life, you'd go worship and carry out the pagan rituals and feasts and worship um, sins at the temple of Zeus, hoping that Zeus would intervene in your life. Um, if you wanted healing, you would go to the uh, to the temple of Asclepios or Asclepios. Uh, I messed it up. Asclepios, I think is how you say that. Asclepios, the god of healing. This was a serpent god, and the snakes that they used at this temple were considered to be a part of the of the mystical pagan cultic ritualistic things that they did to pray for this god to bring healing people came from all over the world to get healing in this temple from this god if you wanted a really good time you would go to the temple of dionysius the god of wine and revelry if you wanted food and provision and good crops you'd go to the god to the uh, pagan temple of demeter if you wanted wisdom you'd go to the temple of Athena, the goddess of wisdom. If you wanted savior and Lord and peace and safety, you would go to the temple of Trajan and you would declare that Caesar is God. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is savior. And the things that happened at these temples were fornication, feasting and fornication are the two words you can use to kind of encompass. They had pagan feasts that were just riddled with debauchery, reveling, riotous uh, lifestyles, destructive lifestyles, combined with fornication, uh, sexual activity with temple prostitutes who were employed at the temple to service the worship, the pagan worship, the cult worship of these false deities. And it was commonplace throughout the culture. It's very important that you know this because this connects to what Jesus is rebuking in the churches at Pergamos and Thyatira. Once a year, Every citizen of Pergamos was required to go to Trajan's temple, pinch some salt, put it on the altar, and declare, Caesar is my Lord and Savior. Caesar is my provider of peace and safety. And if you did not do this, you could be canceled. You could be uh, accused of treason. You could be jailed. You could be martyred. You could be kicked out of the guilds and lose your job, lose all of your ability to participate in the commerce, the system. So you really, the Christians, the Christians were in a very hard place if they did not participate in the pagan system of worship, in the feasts, in the sexual perversion, and in the worship of these false gods, and especially Caesar. So what does Jesus say to the church at Pergamos? Well, he says, first, I know your works and you are where Satan's seat is. Satan had a, apparently a stronghold, a center of operations, a base spiritually, principalities and powers, that kind of thing, of operations in Pergamos. And in spite of the fact, they weren't just surrounded by Greek mythology and Roman mythology, they were surrounded by Satanism. What was going on in this city was satanic at its core. And Jesus said, you're holding fast my name and you have not denied the faith. So he praises that church. And there was a martyr in the church, Antipas. He was a faithful martyr who was slain, a member of the church that was slain as a martyr for his faith. But in, then in verse 14, Jesus says, but I do have some things, a few things against you. There are those in the church that hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed into idols and to commit fornication and those that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. So two doctrines he references, doctrine of Balaam, doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And you can go to Numbers 24 and 25. And there's a story there of the King Balak wanting to curse the children of Israel. So he hires a religious prophet type man, Balaam, who is for sale. And so he says, I want you to curse the children of Israel. But no matter what Balaam does, he can't curse the children of Israel because they've already been promised blessing by God. So even when he opens his mouth to curse, a blessing comes out. So Balaam says, you can't curse them. They're gods. And he's already protected them from the curse. Isn't that an amazing parallel to the gospel? But you can't curse them or conquer them, but you can corrupt them. And so he taught Balak to make the woman of Moab go out and tempt the men of Israel so that they would compromise sexually 
and fornicate and they would be weakened and God would have to chasten them as a result of this. And so Balaam, the idea of Balaam is the idea that you can have it both ways. You can have the doctrine of Jesus and the pagan sexual fornication and idolatry and feasting of the temples of pagan Romanism. So you could have both. And it's a corruption. And it's Satan's way. If he can't curse or conquer the church, then he will try to corrupt the church. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans is most likely the same kind of thing, tracing back to a man named Nicholas, who was one of the early deacons in Jerusalem. But then later, apparently this man went off the rails with radical grace, extreme grace, that, hey, we're saved, we're forgiven, we can do anything. And he got swept up in living a lascivious or a licentious life. And Paul speaks to this, this radical grace concept. It's alive and well in the 21st century. There are lots of Christians who are abusing grace, and they just shrug it off. But, you know, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know what believers are called to do? He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We've been saved from sin. Why would we want to go back and revel in it? Especially when we realize the context of these passages is not that God's a killjoy and doesn't want me to have fun. The context is he's trying to save me and others from self-destructive practices and from destructive influences. Fornication is hurtful to the person fornicating. It's hurtful to the person he's fornicating or she is fornicating with. It's hurtful to the families of both. It's hurtful to the church family that's happening in. These are only destructive realities. They destroy societies. They destroy churches. They destroy families. This lifestyle is destructive. And so Jesus is saving in his call to repentance, in his opportunity to come away from this lifestyle, he's actually expressing grace and mercy and love. It is a loving thing to say, don't do these self-destructive things. Instead, trust me to replace these things with better blessings and with bigger and more wonderful realities. And that's the thing. Jesus always offers something better than Satan can give. There's pleasure in sin for a season, but then sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So there's only destruction that comes out of sin So salvation and the grace of God calls us to holy lives, calls us to walk away, to take our stand lovingly in the truth and to reject the world and the practices of the world, the fornication, the idolatry, um, and the revelry of the world that would only be self-destructive. He says this in verse 16, repent. If you don't repent, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He's saying, I will come and deal with those who are practicing the pagan practices and trying to blend the church into the idolatry and the idolatry into the church. Jesus says, I will deal with it. I won't allow it to continue. But right now you have opportunity to repent. Again, that's grace. Well, then he begins to talk to the church at Thyatira and very similar problems. He says, these things uh, saith the son of God who has eyes like flame on fire and his uh, feet are like fine brass. So the picture of Jesus as a judge again a definitive ruling authority. He says, I know that works. And then he praises the church for their charity, their love. This is a loving church, their service. It's a faithfully serving active church, their faith, their trusting, they're operating in faith, they're expressing faith, their patience, they're enduring, they're, 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 uh, they're pressing forward in faithfulness. And then he says their works are more at the last than at the first. They're on this upward trajectory where their works are increasing their church is increasing. There's momentum. There's growth. But he says in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. A couple comments I want to bring out here. This woman's name probably was not officially Jezebel, but he's likening her to Jezebel. Jezebel was the most wicked ruler of the northern kingdom, the queen who infused Israel with all kinds of fornication and cultic idolatry and paganism. So there's a woman in the church that has appointed herself, declared herself to be a prophetess, to have access to the deeper things of God. Later, Jesus calls these things the deep things of Satan, actually. And she elevates herself into a teaching position. So now it's different than the first church. The first church, uh, fornication and idolatry had crept in, but it was just some in the church that held to the doctrines. In this case, it's, a, it's, a, it's more people, and it's actually 
the curriculum has worked its way into uh, the, 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 the classes at the church. There's a woman teaching and discipling these people into this lifestyle. She's teaching and seducing. That's what she's doing. She's seducing these people that they can be followers of Jesus and that it's okay to commit fornication and it's okay to participate in the feasts at the temple of worshiping idols. Now, uh, one comment very quickly. Paul talked about eating meats that were purchased at the market that had been sacrificed to idols, that that was bothersome, but it wasn't sinful. It was bothersome to the conscience of some people. So that's a different practice. Eating meat that at one time was offered to idols, but was purchased at the grocery store, some believers didn't have an issue with that in their conscience. Others did. And Paul was basically saying in that passage, respect each other's conscience, but no, eating the meat is not bad in this case. In this case, it's a different thing. We're talking in this case about going to the temple, participate in the fornication with the temple prostitute, feasting on the meat that's being offered to idols in an act of worship at the temple. It, the whole thing was an act of worship. It was perverse. It was pagan. It was cultic. It was a betrayal of what it means to follow Jesus. Why? Because these acts of worship to these gods, Jesus is the true God, the only God, the ultimate God, the most high God. He is Lord, only he. He is king, he is provider, he is healer, he is savior, he is wisdom, he is peace, he is safety. And so there's no way that a believer can go into a pagan center and say, this is the goddess of wisdom, and this is the God of provision, and this is the goddess of sex, and this is the God, this is the king God, and this is the savior and Lord God. No. The believer has to say, Jesus is all these things, and I cannot worship these pagan deities. And so, again, this woman teaching in the church, Jesus says in verse 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she refused to repent. Again, mercy before judgment, grace before chastening. But by verse 22, he issues a hard declaration. He will cast her into a bed of sickness. He will them that commit adultery with her will go into that same kind of tribulation unless they repent. Repentance is still an option at this point. And I will kill her children with death. Double emphasis on death. They will be chastened. They will be taken out. Why? So that all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. Jesus will protect his church. This situation would have destroyed his church. And so where there's unrepentance, Jesus is forced to intervene and remove those people. And in this case, he's saying, I will take your life. Similar to what happened in the early church with Ananias and Sapphira. So he says, I will give to every one of you according to your works. We always reap what we sow. But then Jesus gives a promise. He says, but I say unto you, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. So the good news is some remained faithful. Not everybody failed. Not everybody bought into this woman's um, false teaching. And she says, there are some, he says, there are some that have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. So they were saying the, the, the deeper things spiritually. Jesus says it's the, it's the deeper things of Satan. I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. Jesus says, I'm not going to ask anything else of you. Just stay faithful in that which you're already doing. Hold fast until I come. Hold fast in what? Well, this is the church he already praised. Works, charity, service, faith, patience, and growth. So uh, he praised those that were holding fast. That's why I say there's it's individually nuanced. The letter indicts the people in the church that were following this lady, but calls everybody to repentance and praises those that didn't go to this lady's home Bible study. (laughs) So so here's where I want to land today, and thank you for giving me a little extra time. The promise. I skipped the verses where Jesus promises something to every church. He starts it this way, to him that overcomes. What does he mean? Well, John has already talked about overcoming. He's told us that it's our faith that overcomes that by faith we are declared overcomers, victors, uh, that it is the fact that we know Jesus by, by faith, that we've been brought into salvation. It is our salvation that already overcomes the world. So you've already been declared an overcomer in Christ. So what Jesus is saying is repent and, and come back to your overcoming life. You are giving in instead of living out of the salvation and the faith and the trust and the belief that you already have. So 
let your belief bring you to repentance and live out of the belief you truly profess and hold. So he says to the church at Ephesus, to those that overcome, you're going to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. I love that because uh, Ephesus, <clears throat> excuse me, when they return to their first love, they're promised new life, forever life in God's new paradise, new heaven, new earth, new Eden. The second church, Smyrna, the suffering church, the martyr, the martyred church, he says, you will not be hurt of the second death. Hey, you might die once like everybody, but you're not going to be touched by the second death. You're going to live. You're saved. You're secured. You're going to live on. The third church, he says, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. What is the significance of this? Well, they were being called away from the temple feasts and the paganism. And those feasts would have been very pleasurable from a flesh standpoint, okay? Uh, The food and the sexual gratification, the debauchery, it was destructive, but it was also very pleasurable. He says, I've got a better feast, a hidden manna. I believe he's referencing the marriage supper of the lamb that all believers will be gathered to after the rapture where we will sit down and he will serve us and we will dine in um, in, in, in the paradise of God, in the heaven that he's prepared for us before we return for the millennial reign. We will enjoy that hidden manna, a better feast, a better fulfillment. And he says, I will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written. Now, it's, it's, it, that's a wonderful, beautiful reality. The white stone was used for three purposes in ancient world. Uh, the first that comes to my mind is a, a, to be exonerated in the courtroom. Black stone was guilty. White stone was innocent, if the ruling was innocence. Exoneration. Uh, secondly, the white stone was victory, given to a runner or an athlete with the crown. Uh, the one who got victory got a white stone, symbolic of victory. The third and probably the most beautiful picture of the white stone was that when any royal, powerful, ruling person would host a a feast or a banquet or an event, and if you were going to be invited on it, to it, your name would be engraved on a white slab of marble. That was your invitation. And that white slab of marble would be delivered to your house with your name engraved that you, it was your, it was your entrance into this feast this celebration. And I, I should have studied this out before I recorded this video. I think if I'm not incorrect in my memory that the stone also, a white stone was worn by the priest uh, in, old, in Old Testament. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure there's a fourth parallel there. The point is, whatever these people thought when they read this, the white stone picture is victory, exoneration, elevation to priestly status and invitation to the greatest banquet feast of all time in the kingdom of Jesus. So they're giving up temporary destructive pagan feasts and festivals, but they've got a better one coming. I love that picture. You know what I love about this too? He says uh, that there's a new name, my new name, your new name. You have a new name written, engraved that Jesus alone knows. And he's going to give you that new name when you get your new heart and your new body and your new forever life. He, uh, he then promises the last church. He says, he that overcomes to him will I give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and the vessels of a potter shall they, and, and as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I've received of my father. That's a reference to Psalm 2, Jesus conquering the kingdoms of the world, inheriting the kingdoms of the world, ruling with a rod of iron. You know, I don't want to get all heady about, oh, I'm going to rule with Jesus. What does that mean? It's a wonderful reality that believers today that will be raptured and that will be com- uh, coming back with him for the millennial kingdom, we will serve in his, in his administration. It will be a perfect administration, and we will be given authority, delegated authority to rule and reign with him. The the ruling with a rod of iron simply speaks to the strength and the stability and the absolute authority of his rule and reign that we will share. And it would have been significant, why? To first century believers, because they're living every day, 24-7, under the threat of the iron fist of the Roman Empire. And Jesus says, one day, you're going to hold the iron scepter. 
you're going to hold the iron authority. You are going to be in the administration. The tables will be turned. Right now you're oppressed by a kingdom that thinks it is permanent, but it is just temporary, and you are a member of the eternal kingdom, the heavenly administration, and we will rule together. I love that. And I love the final promise, and we'll end here. Jesus says, and I will give him the morning star. I will give him the morning star. Now, who is the morning star? Revelation, later in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus calls himself the morning star. So what does Jesus say to those that overcome, to those that repent and follow him? You're going to get me. (laughs) You have me. Um, And that is awesome. What's my takeaway? What do I love about this? Jesus is present. He cares about his imperfect churches. Jesus hasn't given up on church. Lots of Christians have, but Jesus hasn't. And because Jesus hasn't, I haven't. And because Jesus hasn't given up, you shouldn't. Uh, Pray for your church. Love your church. Be faithful to your church. You say, well, there's hypocrites there. Of course there are. Well, uh, I don't like everything. that. Of course not. It's not a perfect place. No, but it's a beautiful place. And Jesus is active there, and he's changing lives there, and he's blessing his word there. So love the church like Jesus loves the church. Be faithful to your church. And if you don't have a church, find one and uh, let that church minister to you and you minister to that church. So we left off with Revelation 2, and we are seeking at our church to become the church, to be the church Jesus calls us to be, and we're going to pick it up here next week. I will post the message from today, tomorrow afternoon on the channel. I hope you'll enjoy it. I also hope to start a new um, afternoon sermon series, long form teaching again, starting this coming week that will kind of go, we're only doing Revelation once a week, right? Um, and then we're doing Psalms every day. And I'd like to to pick another uh, sermon series and begin to uh, air that together as well. For those of you that are wanting more Bible teaching, more is coming. So love to hear from you. Drop a comment, share a prayer request. Thanks for taking the growing journey with me. Hope you have a great Sunday, and I will see you tomorrow.